All right, good evening and welcome to an all candidates meeting uh, put on by the Strathroy District Chamber of Commerce in partnership with the Portuguese Canadian Club of the Strathroy and produced by our friends at Rogers TV. I'm one of your moderators, Chris Soros from MyFM Radio, alongside the CEO of the Strathroy District Chamber of Commerce, uh, Kathy Manis, and we welcome uh, five candidates with us uh, this evening, and I will introduce them. Uh, from my left, we have representing a new blue party, Mr. Keith Ben, from the Ontario NDP, Catherine Shaler, from the uh, Liberal Party, Kathy Burkard Jessen, from the Ontario Party, Cynthia Workman, and from the None of the Above Party, Stephen Campbell. Please welcome our candidates, please, ladies and gentlemen. So we'll go over the, uh, the rules uh, right off the top so everybody uh, in attendance and at home understands what's going on. Uh, so all candidates will have uh, opening remarks for one minute, um, and then we'll get into our question and answer uh, period. All the questions have been submitted by the public to the Chamber of Commerce in advance. We have a full roster of questions here. Uh, we will rotate uh, per candidate as to which one gets the question. If for the candidate, the candidate that's being asked the question originally will have uh, one minute to answer. Uh, every other candidate will have uh, a rebuttal opportunity for 30 seconds. And the seats were drawn just moments ago, randomly, and that's how we have them up on stage. At the end of the evening, each candidate will have closing remarks opportunity for a total of two minutes. Uh, the reason why I'm holding this yellow card is a 15 second warning to the candidates that you have 15 seconds to wrap it up and then they'll hear this at the end of the 15 seconds, uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll move on. I think we've cut everything, right? Okay, well, let's uh, open it up right off the bat with opening remarks for one minute. We'll start with Mr. Keith Ben. Thank you very much. Yes, my name is, well, maybe I should hold this microphone here so that you can hear me. My name is Keith Ben. I am the candidate for the New Blue Party of Ontario, born and raised in, born and raised in Wallaceburg, where my family arrived in the 1880s. My grandfather and his, and his sons, apparently this mic isn't working. Okay, my grandfather and his sons uh, owned and operated Ben Iron Foundry for six decades. I hold a doctoral degree in earth sciences, 17 years at the University of Ottawa. Since then, I've worked internationally in the minerals industry in management and executive level roles where I have acquired a wealth of experience in accountability that comes with spending other people's money. And when I get to Queen's Park to represent you, I'm gonna bring that with me to make sure that the government is held accountable for how they spend your tax dollars. I've chosen to run with New Blue because it is the only common sense conservative party with the platform principles and organization necessary to win elections and get their candidates to the Ontario legislature. And that's where I'm gonna be serving you in a few weeks from now. Thank you very much. A move to Catherine Shaler. Hi, I'm, the, I'm Catherine Shaler. I'm the Ontario NDP candidate for this by-election. I'd like to thank the Chamber of Commerce for organizing this all candidates debate and, to all, and all of you for coming tonight. When I retired from a career that included a decade of credit union leadership in BC and 40 years of teaching and senior administrative roles in post-secondary education, that mirrored the issues and budgets of running a small town, I followed my daughter and her family to Alvinston because family is very important to me. That was the year the Ford government came to power. And through volunteer work in the community, I rapidly learned the joys and the hardships of rural living. Every year since then, I have seen more and more people struggling. Affordability, rural infrastructure funding, healthcare, education, all of these have an impact on the quality of life in this community. That's why I'm running to advocate for rural Ontario's fair share of resources. Thank you. Kathy Burkhardt, Jess. Well, I want to start by thanking uh, the Chamber of Commerce for hosting us tonight, and of course, Rogers and everybody else that's involved in putting tonight on. And of course, all of you for coming out. And if you're watching from the comfort of your home, thank you for taking the time it really speaks to your commitment to community uh, and the region. I am the mayor of Luke and Badolf. I'm the deputy warden of the county of Middlesex and former three-term warden of the county. I am very proud of the initiatives that I have been able to lead in my community and throughout the county. 
I love what I do. I love the service work that comes from being a municipal leader. And my experience makes me keenly aware of the challenges and opportunities that are in front of us. I have firsthand experience as to how the business of Ontario is conducted and how more and more our rural landscapes and small towns are being ignored. I hear directly from residents just like you when you tell me you no longer feel represented by this government. It's these stories, my commitment to service, and my desire to work for you that has put me at this table tonight. All right, let's uh, move on to Cynthia Work. Good evening. I'd like to thank the Chamber for putting this on tonight, and I'd like to thank everyone for coming out tonight, and I hope I get to meet all of you. My name is Cynthia Workman, and I'm running for the Ontario Party. We stand for faith, family, freedom, fiscal responsibility, and transparency of government. So a little bit about me. Uh, I grew up in Dawn Township in Lambton County, born and raised, and went on to uh, high school in Petrolia. Graduated out of LKCS in Dresden, and I've been living in near Thamesville, Ontario for 35 years, and I work in Middlesex, so I've got you all covered, all the area. And um, right now I'm a registered psychotherapist, and I have a private practice in Alvinston. The reason I'm running is because I want the same Lambton, Kent, Middlesex counties that I grew up in for our children and grandchildren, and I do not want our children to be in the economic pit that the Ford Liberals, I mean Conservatives, are digging our future into. So thank you so much. I look forward to meeting all of you. Thank you. Over to Stephen Campbell. Well, I am Stephen R. Campbell. Uh, you're going to have to research me to find out about me because in Canada at this time, Bill C-18 prevents the rest of the candidates that are expo you're exposed here today from being seen. Um, other things that that's Bill C-18 for the Liberals and another bill coming through is NDP Bill C-372 which if I say nice things about oil and gas I can go to jail and that will be happening next year and all these things of the major media corporations like the CTV has given free time to our other candidates and our other candidates here tonight have not been given their free time and that's actually under the CRTC and it's illegal to happen and you have to file because if we file they will do nothing and then we gives up our option so we can't sue them. So there's a lot of things going on behind your back that you don't know about and these candidates today like Keith, Cynthia, myself cannot be seen by C18. Strathroy today has nice articles on us and they can't share them because of this bill. Um, this first question will start with Keith. What is your opinion about a living wage guarantee for Ontarians? I'm not in favor. I'm not in favor of it because it's just a form, it's creating a form of dependency, which is exactly what the left wing parties in our, in our, jurist, in our province uh, want. That includes the PCs, the Liberals, and the NDPs, of course. When you create a dependency like that, it, it, it inhibits people's desire to get out and earn their own living. It takes away their self-respect. And it, it's, uh, we have already, I mean, welfare is, is available to people. Unemployment insurance, or employment insurance, they call it, I guess, is available to people. I don't see any reason why we should have what I suppose you're referring to as a guaranteed minimum wage. Is that correct? You can't answer me? Okay, well, I'm, I'm assuming for the audience that she's referring to a minimum, a guaranteed minimum wage, and I am very much against that. That's not against a minimum wage for people working, but a guaranteed minimum income, in fact. That's the word I was looking for. I'm not for that. No, we're not. Catherine, we'll go to you next. Answer the same question. What is your opinion about a living wage guarantee for Ontarians? Yes, I mean a living a living wage is the minimum is is different from minimum wage. It's a little bit a little bit higher, um, and it's it's what it in fact costs to for housing and food. It it's 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 uh, it's what it takes to live. 
We're not there yet. We're almost at our minimum wage uh, going up, but it still then will not be a living, a livable wage, living wage, sorry. Thank you. I'm very, I'm very much in favor of a living wage. Um, it, is, it is different than a minimum wage in that a living wage um, is dependent on where you live. So a living wage in London, Ontario may be very different than a living wage in Wallaceburg but it does allow you to be able to provide housing and food on your table, and it is a much more guaranteed income than a minimum wage. Thank you. Okay, now to Cynthia. Hi. Um, no, a, a living wage, it makes you dependent on the government. It gives them more control over your life, and that's not what the Ontario Party or I stand for. We know that um, it's another form of control, and we also know that you really value what you earn. And so without that pride and that work ethic, you don't value it. And really, it's a divisive mechanism that the government wants to divide the classes and to just encourage subsidized poor. Thank you. And lastly, Stephen. I'm, a, I'm against the living minimum wage. There's no such thing as a living minimum wage. There's also a problem with the current minimum wage. Currently, they keep on increasing it because the inflation is 3.1. But they increase it to 3.1, so every time you increase it, the next year you'll have to increase the minimum wage to 3.1 because you're doubling inflation. Because when you impose this, the corporation has to pay payroll taxes, and then they have to increase the prices of everything. You can never have a minimum wage keep on going up. You have to stick at a minimum wage. Uh, we'll move on to question number two, and it'll be to uh, Catherine Shaler for one minute to answer. Uh, question number two, do you support privatization of Ontario health care, and why? Do you support privatization of Ontario health care, and why? We'll start with Catherine Shaler for one minute. Um, I absolutely do not um, favour privatization of health care in Ontario. In fact, what the Ford government is doing is siphoning off public funds. This is taxpayer funds and putting it into private clinics, what they're now calling independent clinics. This is, this is harming our, our health care system and our legacy of universal public health care. Thank you. Uh, for th rebuttals for 30 seconds. We'll start with uh, Kathy burkhardt Justin. I absolutely do not support um, putting public money into a private system. We have a Canadian-wide public health care system that needs to be continually invested in. There's a reason why there are wait times. There's a reason why in our communities we cannot see doctors in our community. There's a reason why we have to wait for um, procedures. There's a reason why in small communities we have to go to London to get uh, care, and that's because money is not being properly invested in our public health care system, and we have to do that. Thank you. To Cynthia Workman, please. So uh, we are in favor of giving people choice over their health care. I was speaking to a highly prestigious methadone doctor today, and he said, if I waited, if the, if the province waited until the government got to putting methadone clinics up and not private ones, we wouldn't have enough methadone clinics. I think that it's only sensible to let people have insurance that if they choose to go and, and get private health care, they can because it's going to reduce the wait times for the people that can't afford it. Thank you. Uh, Stephen Campbell. I am currently against the uh, no, privacy, no privatization of our health care industry. Currently, they're making our healthcare industry look poor because 13,000 people are needed to fill the positions. They're currently offering $5,000 to keep and retain those, uh, our current workers, but 2,000 workers haven't been hired back. We're the only province that have not hired back our unvaxxed workers. Thank you. We'll move to Mr. Keith Ben. 
Yeah, let's, let's uh, try to be precise with our language here huh, so as not to get confused. Allowing privately run clinics to deliver publicly funded health care is not privatization of health care. And it works really well. I've experienced it in France where I lived for six years. I've experienced it in Ontario where there are a few clinics and I've had some x-rays done at one of these private clinics. It was fabulous. It didn't cost me a penny out of pocket. As for true privatization of healthcare, no, of course, we're not for that. But allowing private clinics to deliver publicly funded healthcare, if they do it properly? Sure, no problem. This question will start with Kathy. Sex education has been a key issue in, in the province. How will your party ensure that students continue to have access to curriculum that is relevant to today's world and respects the different cultures and families in Ontario? Well, with a public um, education system, it means that every student that receives education through a public system should be ensured that they can get a safe and equitable education. And that means um, continuing with the uh, sex education that we are currently um, providing in our schools, but it means that um, if, you, if you want a different curriculum, then there are other schools that provide that. But in a public system, we have to ensure that our students, that all of our students' needs can be met and that we can make sure that there are places where they're safe uh, and they can be uh, uh, looked after in a way um, that their answers, their needs can be met um, with privacy um, and with responsibility and in a safe space. Thank you. <laughs> Cynthia? The Ontario Party stands against the radical sexualization that is being propagated to our schools and our children. We believe that parents are in charge of teaching their children morals, values, and beliefs, and that includes sex education. I went to Don Central School. We learned the birds and the bees. We didn't learn all this radical ideology and curriculum. Doug Ford promised to get rid of it. He lied. And so we need to bring reading, writing, and arithmetic back into the schools and let parents take you. Stephen? Unfortunately, I cannot answer this question in any way, shape, or form. I would be fired if I answered this question. This is the state of our country at this time. Keith. Our public schools, as well as any other alternative schools, must teach our, our children uh, the knowledge and the skill sets for a bright and productive future so they can build a good life. That's what schools are for. Schools are not for preaching political indoctrination like the Liberals and NTPs want and the PC party goes along with very well, okay? They have no problem with it, apparently. Let's get back to teaching the basics so that we have children who come out knowing math and science and geography and all of the other basic subjects. Thank you. Catherine? The curriculum in the school, whether it's sex education or something else, but let's stick with that, is, is um, it, it reflects the diversity of the communities and it, it, um, and, and must continue to and must provide um, education for the world in which these kids are going to be living. We'll move to uh, question number four. We'll start with uh, Cynthia Workman for one minute. Do you believe supporting the two battery plants will prove to be a cost-effective investment in Ontario? Do you believe supporting the two battery plants will prove to be cost-effective an investment in Ontario? We'll start with Cynthia for one minute. No, I do not. Number one, we're investing a lot of Ontario's money in a plant that doesn't employ any Ontarians. And so, number two, we know that the electric car, um, they just are not what they are uh, built up to be. And so, in the end, no, I don't think so. People can't afford electric cars. People can't um, afford to be paying for foreign workers to come over and get the jobs that Ontario is investing in. And also, what are we going to do with all of the um, pollution that is going to be caused by uh, these batteries that 
nobody can recycle, nobody can uh, get rid of. So no, I, I think it's a, a stupid thing that we've invested our money in. And I think that's just another Ford liberal, uh, I mean, conservative deal that he's made. Thank you, uh, Stephen Campbell. I'm not against all additional taxes at this time with the carbon tax. This is investment that should not be coming out of our pockets. We should be investing in our oil industry. And currently, Irving Oil gets $8 billion from outside oil of our country. We should be investing in our country. We should be making money off that. And if there was a good green technology like ammonia, we should be investing in that and not this poor technology. Thank you. Uh, Keith Ben. No, they most definitely will not be cost effective for the very simple reason that we will not increase our inventory of mineral deposits rapidly enough to satisfy the fantasy land energy transition that we're being sold by our governments. Um, and if you don't believe me, you can listen to the CEOs of the largest mining companies in the world who will tell you that there's no way that they can provide the amount of copper and nickel and cobalt and other on the time scale that our governments are promising. Those, comp those, those plants will fail, period. Thank you, Keith. Catherine Shaler. I, I think at this point we don't know whether they're a cost-effective um, investment, but they are one step in the direction of transitioning to a greener economy. Thank you. Pat Herger. Time will tell um, as to if it's a cost-effective uh, investment that the province has made. I do believe it will be a boon to our um, region. But I also think it's, a, it's, it's cautionary in that we cannot continually to be investing in these multi-million, billion-dollar corporations and forgetting about our small businesses. They play a part in this as well, and we need to ensure that government also um, invests in our small businesses so that they can support what's happening in our region. Thank you. Going on to our next question, we'll start with Stephen. Does, you already had your opportunity. Yep. Um, does your party have a concrete plan to retain and recruit nurses to address the growing shortage? Well, yes, I already mentioned it. We would, hire, we would want to hire back the 2,000 nurses that are currently out of work. Currently in Stratford, there was a doctor if she was a plastic surgeon, she had a two-year two wait list. Where do you think those people went? They had to go to another person. You'll have a four-year uh, wait list. We need to hire back these crucial people to get our wait times back. If you had cancer on your face, you can't wait four years. Thank you. Keith? I agree. We need to hire all those people back as quickly as possible and probably offer them some compensation for the unjust loss of their wages. But we also need to increase the number of places uh, available in our medical schools uh, in order to train our own young people, citizens and landed immigrants in Canada, to fill the necessary slots in the medical system. And those we should be giving preference in our university medical schools to Canadian citizens and landed immigrants. Too often they give too many slots to foreign students simply because they pay higher tuition fees. Thank you. Catherine. We need many more nurses and other healthcare workers. And we've lost many who were overworked, overburdened, burned out, um, and, and had their wages capped uh, during COVID and then afterwards during inflation. Privatization and private clinics also siphoned off nurses who were desperate for jobs and better, and better working conditions. We can draw them back by getting that retro, that retro wages to them faster. And I think my time is up. Thank you. Kathy? Well, we have to start by looking after the people who look after us. So we have to ensure that a public health care system is a place where our nurses want to work. So that means making sure that we are paying them a competitive wage, that they want to work in the public health care system, that they, we provide them with um, supports so that they don't experience the burnout that we've seen them experience in the last few years. 
We also have to um, streamline the accreditation process so that internationally trained, uh, the internationally trained workforce can work, actually work in Ontario and Canada, and that's something we're committed to. Thank you. And lastly, Cynthia. I think that we need to hire back the nurses that were fired as a result of the forced uh, COVID uh, mandates and apologize to nurses. I also think we need to make workplaces safer for nurses. They are facing a lot of stress in a lot of the hospitals on, on different levels. We need to make safe workplaces and respect what they do. Also, we could alleviate the healthcare system slightly by reducing immigration levels because we know that that is really taking a toll on the healthcare system. Thank you. All right, we'll move to a brand new question and we'll start with uh, Keith Ben for one minute. Are you in favor of exploring the possibility of building homes that could sell for a maximum of $500,000? There have been suggestions made that under certain conditions that may be possible. If elected, will you promise to give this thought your fullest attention? Keith Ben for one minute. Well, if I understand correctly, you're talking about designing and building homes that would be relatively affordable, $500,000 or less. The marketplace should probably control what sort of houses are being built. And it seems to me that the marketplace right now should be demanding basically that we're building lower cost housing because people can't afford to pay for the larger houses with the interest rates being what they are. Okay. Now that said, I would not, I would certainly consider and give serious consideration to ways to encourage without subsidy from taxpayers to encourage builders to build homes that are more affordable in neighborhoods that are more afford affordable. I would definitely give that very due consideration, yes. Thank you. Uh, Catherine Shaler. I'm not sure even 500,000 would be attainable, maybe affordable. The province needs to get back into the business of building homes, attainable homes. That means four working with municipalities on fourplexes. It means purpose-built rental units. It means more truly affordable housing. Thank you. <laughs> Kathy Burkhard Jessen. Well, if the question has to do with a market-driven product, no, the government shouldn't step in. However, if we're looking at a product that is affordable or attainable, absolutely the government has a role to play in that. And they can incentivize developers so that they can build purpose-built um, product fourplexes. Uh, we can go back to investing in co-op housing, RGIs. That's investments that haven't been made by this by governments in over 30 years, and that's where we're missing out, and that's the role for government to, to play, not in driving the market, but in driving, incentivizing affordable housing. Cynthia Workman. First of all, uh, I don't think, I, I'm a registered psychotherapist. I could not afford a house even remotely close to $500,000, especially with the interest rates and inflation as it is today, so affordable housing that is actually a myth, I think, in this day's economy. What I would like to see is, in, you know, we need affordable housing, but we also need a government that can bring Canadians or Ontarians back to making a decent living and reduce the inflation any way they can, even provincially. Thank you. Unfortunately, the immigration is the cost, is the problem with these high prices. 500,000 is not an affordable home. An affordable home in London, Ontario used to be 100,000. I owned many condos up until 2009. I sold out thinking that was the top of the market, but that is because of this immigration problem, it has spun our whole system out of control. Until we fix immigration, we are gonna continue to have this problem. Um, so this question will start with Catherine. What distinguishes your party's education platform from those of other parties? Investment, investment in education. Um, our, our education funding, whether it's K to 12 or post-secondary, is among the lowest of any province in this country. And that's, that's shameful. We're a, wealthy, we're a wealthy province. We have the highest GDP. So first of all, 
uh, fair wages to teachers and not, not capping them as Bill 124 did, and that, and healthcare, and sorry, and education workers. Many became burned out during COVID. They become burned out by the, the, the mental health issues and the education deficit. Uh, we find it in many of the students since COVID and education workers as well have, are, are, are burned out and leaving the profession. We need to draw them back. Thank you. Kathy? So for the Ontario Liberal Party, it is an investment. It's an investment in teachers, education workers, and students, so that teachers and education workers are supported uh, with um, a fair wage and with support so that they don't burn out, much like our nurses, that students have access to an equitable and fair, safe uh, curriculum, and investment in our buildings. There hasn't been meaningful investment in our schools in the maintenance of them. Many schools are crumbling, and we need to invest billions of $16 billion in our schools to ensure that they're safe places for education. Thank you. Cynthia, are we allowed to ask for the question to be repeated? What distinguishes your party's education platform from those of other parties? Well, thank you. That is a really good question. So first of all, our platform on the Ontario, in the Ontario party is that we want back to basics, reading, writing, and arithmetic. We do not want uh, critical race theory. We do not want uh, gender ideology, and we do not want uh, explicit sexual uh, education uh, in our schools. Also, we in favor in supporting financially alternative schools um, and also parents that choose to educate their children at home, we feel that that is worthy. Thank you, Stephen. As for properly funding the education system, what we've been doing for a long time is the top gets 1%, which is $1,000, and the bottom gets 1%, which is $100. The top should only get 1%, but the bottom needs 3%. Those workers, we've caused a wage gap for so long that we've caused this inflationary period that we cannot longer support our education system because the money is gone. Yes, well, uh, it seemed like the, uh, the Liberals and the New Death Scribes uh, that you've seen in Martin, uh, the New Zealand Party does not believe in solving every problem by storing more money at. Uh, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, I'm a bit believer in accountability for spending taxpayers' money. I want to see an open and transparent accountability of how our money is being spent in the public education system and then see how we can spend that money better in order to make the system better. Thank you. <laughs> Question number eight, we'll start with uh, Kathy Burkhardt-Jessen. I always hit the long <laughs> questions here. Uh, many students in Ontario cannot afford the cost of tuition, which creates inequitable barriers to post-secondary education. What is your party's plan for improving access to post-secondary education for students from all socioeconomic backgrounds and two, reducing public universities' reliance on tuition fees? Kathy burkhardt Jessen. Thanks for the question, Chris. So the first thing we would do would be eliminate the pro pro provincial portion of interest on all OSAP loans, including for former students who are still paying off those uh, student loans. I actually have a son who's been out of um, higher education for a number of years, and he is still paying off that loan. Um, we also need to increase the uh, annual income threshold for OSAP uh, repayment to 40000 so it's those sort of things that the Liberal government will be looking at. The reality is uh, we are a party that is um, currently just putting a platform and policy together, but understanding that um, the key is we have to make it easier for students to repa repay the loans and increase the thresholds so that the burden isn't on them for years and years and years to come. Canada, it's just a, si a sidebar because it is a two-part question. We'll give rebuttals at 45 seconds for this particular question because it's a two-parter. Okay, 45 seconds, uh, starting with uh, Cynthia Workman. So I think that universities need to be more self-sufficient and uh, run it like a business, less uh, government doles, especially since they have so many um, strict 
policies on free speech and what they are teaching and not teaching in universities. I also feel that um, we need to remember that our students need to have hope when they get out of university. I too have a son who graduated and he is just, you know, beside himself because the jobs are not there to pay for the cost of what he paid in his university education. I also think the Ontario party, you know, we have said that we will give greater incentive to students. Sorry, Cynthia, thank you. Uh, Stephen Campbell for 45. Um, as many of our institutions, the top level executives are taking millions of dollars, especially in these high, uh, like the universities are taking million dollar contracts. And this is probably why the tuition might be so high for the, we'd have to actually dive deep into their books and we'd have to get another party in there in order to dive deep into these books to figure out why these tuition fees are so happening to our students. Uh, our, it is properly funded. I went through the OSAP uh, program. I paid off mine nice and quick, but I picked the correct career and didn't waste my money on a, on a degree that wouldn't help. Thank you. Uh, Keith Benton. Okay, well, uh, the, the idea of opening up the books and finding out how it is that universities spend the taxpayers' money that they get through the government has already been covered, and I totally agree with that. That's very much a new blue policy. But I would also like to point out that university is not the be-all and end-all. I think maybe we have too many of our young people who are targeting going to university and taking, in many cases, courses or programs that are not going to earn them any money. Uh, and that are not going to allow them to pay off their loans when they could be out uh, learning to be artisans, uh, artisans, as he said in French, um, tradespeople, for instance, um, and uh, serving, uh, filling jobs that are desperately needed in this, in this country. A, a university education is, is not vocational training. It is training for life, and more and more universities are, are combining academic and applied learning, and I think that's a very good thing, so that they have co-op programs, they have practicums combined with their, with their other program learning. As far as access, that is, um, tuition, dependence on tuition has, has, has happened with universities since the 90s, when, um, the, when provincial funding was reduced and reduced every single year so that you'd almost think they're not public, uh, publicly funded institutions anymore. The tuition, the reliance on tuition is not good. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, this question will start with Cynthia. Ontario funds its public hospitals at the lowest rate of any province in Canada. We have the fewest hospital beds per person of any province. Will you commit to improving public hospital funding to bring it to the average of the rest of Canada? Well, we will improve healthcare because we're gonna seek efficiency over bureaucracy by permitting nonprofit organizations and private corporations to build, own, and manage hospitals. And we will permit citizens to hold supplemental private medical insurance we will also provide funding for greater public hospital bed capacity and more healthcare workers. That being said, I think that our healthcare system is being overwhelmed by the out of control immigration system where we have people coming in that we have not, that have not been able to pay into the system. And so that's where we are really um, under, under service because we absolutely can't, you know, afford it. We can't, money out of thin air and that is what a lot of people in Ontario um, know because that's how we live our own households right we can't make money we have to make trim the fat from the top so that the so that there's more work more room for growth for our thank you Stephen the same industry it's properly funded however with the immigration problem that is a problem as well you have one million more people here per year. We need more hospitals to be built 
We need more staff to cover that. And that needs to come from the federal government, not the provincial, because they're bringing in this problem to our province. So they need to figure out how many people are coming into our province and then they need to properly fund a new hospital and then we need to get our workers rehired. Keith. Yes, well the main problem with funding for our health care and some other programs in Ontario is that we allow the federal government to collect in terms of income tax approximately two dollars for every dollar that the Ontario government collects. This is money from Ontario taxpayers. We need to have the province of Ontario collect a large enough proportion of our income taxes in this province to cover all of the, the services for which the province is responsible for managing and delivery, including health care. Thank you. Catherine? Yes, we favor raising public hospital funding to at least the average of the national average. It, it's, it's well below that right now. It's, it's right down at the bottom. This is part of the problem with, with public health care funding in this province. They need stable funding. They need, the volumes are going higher. They're all running deficits. Yes, we need to fund our public hospitals, in particular, our small community rural hospital. Thank you. Kathy. Absolutely, the Ontario Liberal Party is committed to fully, um, fully funding public, the public health care system in a way that it should be, and that means no longer funding private health care, taking those dollars out of private health care, putting it into the public system so that we can have a public system that actually works. All right, thank you. Uh, question number 10, we'll start with uh, Stephen Campbell for one minute. Uh, the riding of Lampticat Middlesex is bigger than the island of Prince Edward Island. Some of you very familiar with constituents east of Newberry, some familiar with constituents west of Newberry, and some of you are not. So if elected, how do you connect with your voters, your constituents in such a huge riding? We'll start with Stephen Campbell for one minute. If I was elected, I am an independent representative, so I believe in referendums and recall. So on key issues, let's say the Education Act that I can't talk about, I would actually go to each community and poll the community to get your true feelings. Then I would take your true feelings to Queen's Park in order to relay that information. So I would go out to the community in every small town and poll your communities. Now, there are some people, I take a poll and maybe they don't agree with it. That's where recall comes in. So then they could get a petition to meet my, my polling. And if uh, they got enough signatures, I would re-poll the district with a larger poll. And I would take your true feelings to Queen's Park, where another party may be bound by party controls. They will push through items like the Dresden dump um, where the PC party may push that through with no representation. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, Keith Ben. Um, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to ask you to repeat that. How do you stay connected to your constituents that voted in a riding that's larger than Prince Edward Island? Uh, well, I spend lots of time in the riding and I drive around and I meet people very much in the way that I'm doing it right now as I run for election. It's, it's not that hard to do. Um, if you have a well-organized schedule and you're willing to travel, I don't see the problem. I'm covering the riding quite well, thank you very much, and I think I can conti continue to do it uh, throughout a four-year term without any problem. Thank you. Catherine Shaler. Well, it is a huge riding, and, um, and, and going door-to-door -door and meeting people is, is one good way to connect. Events like this, for which we're very grateful, also put us out there. And then once you're, you're in position, you're the MPP, you would get around in the same sort of way. Public meetings, um, going to the communities, meet, meet and greet sessions, open houses. Yes, it's possible. Thank you. Kathy Burkhardt, just. So engagement with community is something that my track record actually is built on. Anybody in Luke and Badoff can see me out and about, and I would do the same thing with Lambton, Kent, Middlesex. I'm not afraid to meet with people. I'm not afraid to have conversations, and I would do that. 
whether that is, as Catherine said, in a forum like this on a one-on-one -on -one basis, going out to community activities, going to the local coffee shop, and organizing um, actual formal uh, meetings in my constituency office. I'm definitely not uh, afraid of public uh, and meeting everybody and having that face-to-face. -face. Thank you. <laughs> Cynthia Workman. So luckily, I'm quite familiar with Lambton Kent Middlesex because uh, I've driven the whole place millions of times with my mother who loves to go on long drives. Um, I will be, first of all, guaranteed to be in the riding more than I'm not. I will be having town halls regularly because I love meeting the people of the Lambton Kent Middlesex riding. I grew up here, I live here, and I work here. I'll be in the riding making personal phone calls regularly, and I will listen and not dictate. Thank you. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay, and this will be our last question. Um, we'll start with Keith. We've heard a lot about waiting lists for special education. What would your party do to address this challenge? Once again, I'll give a very similar answer to other questions. Open up the books, see why there's a shortage of money for this. I, I fully expect that in the budgets that are presented to government when, they, when, when, school, when the school system or school boards are, uh, demand uh, or request money each year, they probably have a budget for that, and yet they're not delivering the service. I want to know why is the service not being delivered? Before we throw any more money at the problem, we have to understand why the money we're using is not solving the problem. Is it a question of personnel? Is it a question of planning? Or is it truly a question of not enough money? If it's not enough money, then we need to find more money. But otherwise, we just need to fix the problem. Whether that's sounding more personnel or just training people to do their job properly, we have to find out. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Catherine? We have a shortage of, of teachers. We have a shortage of, of special needs teachers and education workers. We have, to the extent where in, in some districts, they're having to move a specialized teachers and education assistants into regular classrooms because they're needed there. We, we need to fund more education workers. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll go to Kathy. So it starts by establishing a comprehensive, a comprehensive uh, program that addresses exactly what is needed in each and every school. The needs of each school are very different, but we have to ensure that the wraparound services are meeting the needs of the students. And that means investing in teachers. It means investing in our educational workers that support the teachers. These are investments that have not been made during the last six years, and it's time that those investments are needed, are, are met, are made, excuse me, um, so that our students can continue to thrive. Thank you. We'll go to Cynthia. I think that the education system is funded well but I think the money is spent in ridiculous places such as the ideology that's being uh, taught in our schools based on critical race theory, uh, teaching about you know sexuality, gender issues, that we need to get back to putting the money into programs like special education, like helping our children that need help, like giving teachers more help in the classroom with EAs, not this extracurricular stuff that is radical. Thank you. And lastly, Stephen. There is a shortage of teachers at this time, but at one time per year, we had 4,000 extra teachers. So we would extend, we extended their program to be a one year uh, program to a two year so that we would, wouldn't have a backlog of teachers. So it seems like there's a hiring practice and a disconnect between the funding model and the teacher model of having those teachers. I also know teachers that have spent at least five years and they're still on the substitute list, like they're not being hired. Thank you. So that concludes our round of questions for the evening. Um, next, we'll go into our um, closing remarks, and uh, each candidate will have two minutes, and we're going to start with Stephen. Yes. Well, I 
I'm Stephen Robert Campbell. Uh, like I said before, we are being silenced, three of us on the stage tonight. Uh, I'd like to thank Rogers TV for having a true all candidates debate. This doesn't happen in our country. I have ran in a city district where they prevent you from being seen, they prevent you from being on stage. Rogers TV is probably the only true station that actually follows our CRTC rules. So it's, it's nice to be here to even speak to you here tonight. Um, all these candidates today, our local station here, uh, My FM and Strathroy today has put up nice profiles for everyone to see. But unfortunately with C18, they can't share the material. Only you can share the material of the candidates you like tonight. And that's the state of our country right now. So I really like to thank you for being here tonight. Thank you. Cynthia, I'd like to thank the Commerce for putting this on tonight so you can meet off all of us. Um, and I'd like to thank everyone for coming out. Um, I think that, uh, you know, the, the, Lambton Ken the Lambton County that I grew up in, I want it back for our children. I've always been passionate to stand for what is good and right using good old Canadian common sense and grit. I understand you know, the need to advocate for those who can't advocate for themselves. I want to bring family values back and I want to reduce the radical ideology permeating schools, government overreach into every aspect of the lives of Canadians, wasteful government spending, and perhaps the most disturbing, the blatant and intentional attack, woke ideology targeting our children and most vulnerable, which is being driven by a larger world agenda such as the WEF. They're all a part of why I'm running for the Ontario party and for the Lambton Kent Middlesex MPP. I have made it my personal mandate to ensure the conservative voice is heard from the rural routes of Lambton Kent Middlesex. If you want our children to be taught morals, values and beliefs at home and actual education in the schools, if you want your tax dollars to be spent on preserving the family unit and to be actually able to afford one, if you believe in the sanctity of human life from natural conception to natural death, then stand with me and the Ontario Party bringing back conservative common sense to preserve the sovereignty of the province and to preserve the sovereignty of our communities. Let's be courageous and stand side by side against the tyranny of Ford, his liberal cronies in Ottawa and the globalists who seek to bring down our democratic and free way of life. On May 2nd, I ask that you choose the only real Conservative Party left and please vote for me, Cynthia Workman and the Ontario Party. Let's make Lambton Kent Middlesex and Ontario great again. Thanks again. God bless you and God bless Lambton Kent Middlesex. We'll go to Kathy. Well, once again, I want to thank the organizers for putting tonight on and the audience for being here and those watching back at your convenience um, for giving the time to this meeting. You know, you have a big decision in front of you, and it's one that you cannot take lightly. It's a unique opportunity to have a by-election. We don't always get this. But the decision to run for the Ontario Liberal Party was one that I did not take lightly. It took me a lot of time to, to come to this decision. And what enticed me to run for the Liberals was the opportunity to build a platform that is based on these types of conversations, where residents and organizations are consulted, where policy and representation is based on the needs and the challenges and the opportunities of the communities um, like ours. You know, voting for me is not going to change the government but electing me will give you the representation that you haven't had in quite a while. Representation that will listen, that will talk with you, and will have these important conversations to advocate for you and to be your voice. I have a pretty strong track record when it comes to representing community. I have a track record where I show up. Not everybody on the ballot showed up tonight. I'll ask the questions for this riding that for years have not been asked. And I will hold to account this government, because right now in this region, that is not happening. So I ask you to vote for me, vote for that voice, and I'll be the one that really, truly represents you. Catherine? Brooke Alvinston is my home, and I care about it deeply. 
the Ford government has totally ignored the pleas of county and municipal governments throughout this riding and run roughshod over their wishes, as in the case of the Dresden landfill. It's past time for rural communities to have a strong voice at Queens Park that delivers on its promises. I want to channel my time, energy, and experience into being that voice for you. If you have never before considered voting NDP, this by-election is a golden opportunity to test out what an NDP representative can do, for I would be joining the leader of the official opposition at Queens Park. You won't be changing the government, but you'll be sending a strong message to the Ford government that you've had enough of being ignored, enough of taxpayer dollars directed toward private health care, enough of overcrowded classrooms and insufficient support for vulnerable students, enough of small businesses struggling to survive, enough of paved over prime agricultural land. There's a poster in my campaign office with a photo of Tommy Douglas, an early leader of the NDP and the founder of Universal Health Care in Canada. He says, courage, my friends. There's still time to make the world a better place. Join me in making Lambton, Kent, Middlesex a better place. I ask for your vote on May 2nd. Thank you to everyone for your participation tonight, my fellow candidates, our moderators, and all of you who have given up watching the leaf this evening. <laughs> And lastly, Keith. Ontario is desperately in need of a new common sense conservative political party to get to Queen's Park and make the province run properly. All the other parties, the two, the Liberal and NDPs here and the PCs as well, seem to be convinced that this province has a revenue problem. We don't have a revenue problem, we have a spending problem. And we have to spend our money properly. I have some idea about that, as I said before. I've managed mineral exploration budgets that would exceed most small towns in south, uh, budgets in southwestern Ontario. The New Blue Party is the only alternative conservative party that you can vote for in this election that has a shot at winning. We have a province-wide presence, and we are ready to get into Queen pa Queen's Park in this by-election with me as the tip of the spear for a renewal of common sense conservatism. And then when the folks see what we can do at Queen's Park, we'll elect a whole bunch more new, new blue candidates in the upcoming or in the next uh, general election. As the new blue candidate, I represent the only choice on the ballot for voters who seek a return to common sense conservatism that will result in economic prosperity, job creation, and the protection of our precious farmland, which we haven't talked about much here this evening. This renewed common sense conservatism will also create a more efficient healthcare system that will provide better access to the services that you pay for, and it will provide for schools where our children will learn what they need for a bright, successful future, rather than being politically indoctrinated by the NDP and Liberal parties with the blessing of the go-along, get-along key C party. On May 2nd, let's make history right here in Lambton, Kent, Middlesex by voting in the first new blue party MPP to represent you to get the ball rolling for a rebirth of common sense conservatism in our province. Thank you. Thank you for your support and thank you for your vote. So I just want to take a moment to thank all the candidates for coming and participating tonight. We uh, know it's difficult to put your hat in the ring, and we appreciate your service and your time uh, for the riding here. Um, I also want to thank the public for coming to attend this evening and for submitting your questions um, to us in advance to have this uh, conversation this evening. Um, I'd also like to thank again the Portuguese Club of Strathroy for hosting us in their establishment here, Rogers uh, for televising this for us, which we'll also share on YouTube, on our social media, so everyone will be able to watch it again. Um, I'd like to say thank you again to my co-moderator, Chris, from MySM, and um, thank you for coming to the Strathroy District Chamber of Commerce All Candidates meeting. A quick note, Election Day is May 2nd. Um, there are advanced polls. For more um, information, it's available on elections.on.ca. All the information you need there is online and uh, get out and vote. <laughs>